Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Amor from StopSufferingAbout.com. I'm here today with Marise godet Copan. How did I do? Very well. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for inviting me, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I'm really excited to talk to you. So let me give a little introduction uh, to, uh, to you, to our audience. Marise godet Copin was born and raised in Brussels, Belgium, and she's been living in New York for the last 25 years. She's a translator by trade and a coach and writer by heart these days. Marise had a 14-year struggle with anxiety and its many symptoms, lightheadedness, trouble sleeping, hypersensitivity to noise, dizziness. A long quest to find a peaceful way led to trying therapy, yoga, biofeedback, Jin Shin Do, emotional freedom technique, somatic experiencing, acupuncture, self-help, and spiritual books and programs. It all helped, but life became very limited anyway. In May 2017, Marise was introduced to the Three Principles and to Nicola Bird's A Little Peace of Mind program. Understanding the transient nature of the human experience and the innate resilience and wisdom at our core has changed everything for her. I loved that story. And I just want to say sort of briefly before we start, but I was practicing reading your bio beforehand like I do before I go on air just so I don't stumble too much. And when I was reading just to myself the list of all the things that you had done, you know, to try to help yourself and alleviate your anxiety, which is so common among, every, you know, everyone I've interviewed, including myself, I actually got tears in my eyes. Like it just made me feel so moved. One, that we try so hard, you know, to feel better. And then two that now we've we've found we've come to this understanding so um at the very end of that you say you say how your life that your life has changed and it's opened up a bit why don't you share a little bit more about what what that looks like now oh what it looks like today funny yeah. enough just just finished a short blog post about that um to just put my thoughts together about how i see the change and I guess, you know, it's not that I was, well, I had my times where I was really miserable, but just before coming across Nicola, I was reasonably happy. Um, I had symptoms on and off, and my life was pretty limited, but I was also aware that it was a good life, you know? I mean, I had no huge health issues, a loving family, uh, you know, roof over my head. I was really aware of all those blessings. But what's changed now is that from being happy with a small life, I'm just being amazed at a big life. And, you know, I find myself traveling, coaching. I mean, who would have thought, right, even a year ago? Wow. And, uh, you know, so meeting strangers. I used to say, I don't like people. Actually, except maybe for you, I don't like people. And now I'm finding myself liking people. Mm. I was like, what's up with that? And I'm surprised that every corner by what I go out to do, whether I feel anxious or not, because I'm not saying that I don't feel it still. Mm. I do sometimes. It's gotten so much better, but I still feel it. But life is basically open. So like when you reached out to me and asked if you could interview me, I said, yes. Whereas before I might have said, oh my God, no, 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 no one can listen to me. I would not, I wouldn't know what to say. I don't want to spend hours writing a script. I mean, it would have been just un very uncomfortable. And now it's just not a problem anymore. I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know, I have to pinch myself so often these days because I just didn't know it. This was still in the cards for me. Yes, yeah, brilliantly said, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and one of the places, well, the place where I first learned about you was in Nicola Bird's A Little Peace of Mind Facebook group. Um, and one of, the, you're an admin there. And so just for our listeners, I'm going to give a little bit of background on this story. And this was actually the reason that I wanted to reach out to you. So there was someone in the group and she was having a little bit of discomfort. Um, and this is the question that she asked. How do we deal with moods that are caused by thinking about real injustices? And um, you responded and your response was one of those things where 
you know, I just felt everything shift. And the resp- what you said was, why would you want any other experience? And it was, you know, you can hear something a thousand times, and I, but I heard it the a thousand and first, and I, I felt like the world kind of cracked open for me at that moment. I went for a walk afterwards, and I could just feel, you know, I just had that feeling of how everything feels so different. So, and then, and then, in addition to that, sorry, this is a long prelude to the question, <laughs> but as I was preparing for the call, then what it made me realize too is that. For those of us who have been seeking answers and doing a lot of self-help stuff, I, and I don't know if that's true for this lady who answered asked the question on the Facebook group, but we got we got really great at managing ourselves, you know, managing our feelings, managing our thoughts. If something happens, we have a strategy or a technique uh, for dealing with it, and so that. I think becomes a habit that's that can be a little bit difficult to break and I think that that's one thing that you were addressing but I'd love for you to expand on that you know that answer why would you want any other experience because as you said the core of our suffering comes from wanting something different and not just with regards to anxiety with anything else that shows up in our life I mean this feeling of no, you know, of resistance shows up. Of course it shows up. I mean, we're not just going to go, yeah, you know, I like everything. That's just not our nature, right? I mean, we have preferences. We say yes, we say no. But for me to realize that my fighting anxiety or even my trying to accept anxiety, which was still showing that I was not okay with it, Because if I had to try and accept it, it meant that I was not okay with it, right? I mean, that's how I see it now. That just kept feeding the monster. And it's very common in the anxiety world to say, don't react, you know, just let it pass and all these things. But it still feeds the idea that anxiety is a thing. Mm. And what I saw through with the, Nicola's help and her program is that it's not a thing. It's just a habit of mind. I mean, it's, we just, you know, we think ourselves anxious and then we be- believe it's important. But when that core resistance to what shows up fades away, my goodness, life becomes so much easier. (laughs) And I still catch myself, you know, there was something going on in the family recently, and I was really angry for like a couple of hours. And then I wasn't. I mean, it's not as if I said, no, 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 I have to accept what's coming up, you know, you know, it's just like, I'm angry, I'm not. I'm anxious, I'm not, you know, it's not, it's this okayness with whatever flows through me, that And I can't give you a recipe for getting there. It's just (laughs) happened over time as I saw more and more the truth in this natural flow of emotions in us. Mm. It's here, it goes away. It's here, it goes away. And, And that's how it works. Right. Yes. Yeah. I don't answer your question, but I just... No, you know... Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. And it makes me think of that very famous Sydney Banks quote about if, you know, if the only thing people did was stop being afraid of their own experience, that alone would change everything. Yes, yes. And what I've, I've come to see too, is that there's this space of reactivity, you know, like when we have a real problem, we first, I mean, in my experience, the first thing we do is react. I mean, I don't care how enlightened people are, but I think the first thing we do is react. But to be able to to take that step back, it's not even taking a step back, it's this awareness comes in of it's it may be happening out there, but it's still my perception in here. So let let that settle. 
let that settle a little and see what shows up then. And I think that's what I meant with why would you want anything different in your experience? Because it's just to get a pause there, enough of a pause to see that this experience is going to shift by itself. And then from a place of non-reactivity, something else will show up. Fresh thought will come, right? Yeah. Right. That's been my experience over and over again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it does, you know, I just think, and it didn't occur to me until this morning, but I just think this is such an important point about the, you know, the big self-help journey that so many of us have been on and the way that now we're we're in a way we're having to unlearn a lot of what we learned before uh a lot yeah a lot of those management techniques like i talked about earlier um did you find that that was something that you had to tackle with or ha or maybe still are dealing with actually no i mean that might be surprising to you but i think one thing that really helped me from the get-go was that I had completely given up. <laughs> yes. uh, no, but it's true. So I entered 2017 because I came across Nicola in May uh, 2017. And I entered that year with, and I don't do New Year's resolution, but that year I decided if there's one thing that I'm going to try and commit to is not to try anything anymore. Just to see, you know, I can be happy enough with my anxiety. It's fine. I'm tired. I am so tired of trying. I'm done. And let's see what happens. So I let myself basically flow, you know, for a few months. And then out of the blue, Nicola appeared on Facebook one day. And I remember looking at that picture and, you know, solution. I can't remember what the words were, but thinking to myself, no, no, I am not clicking on this. I promised myself nothing ever again. And then she just came back, you know, day after day, there was another ad and I was like, I mean, she, you know, she's good. So at one point I gave up again and I clicked. And then when I listened to her, I'm sure like a lot of us in her program, it was like, oh my God, this woman knows what I'm talk what I'm going through. She knows for the first time with all the stuff I had tried, even with those who had gone through anxiety, it never quite sounded the way Nicola sounded on that day to me. And because it was free, I signed up for one webinar and then that's it. I joined her program and I thought, I have nothing to lose. I know I promised myself not to try anything, but you know. I, I did it. And of course, thank God I did it because everything, everything changed. But one thing that was really funny during the beginning of the program is that a few weeks in, Nicola admitted to her migraines coming back. And I remember thinking, what? It's not gone. She's not fixed. This is a waste of my time. You know, again, I tried something and it didn't work, but something, I mean, it was a 12 week program and I think we were at week six or seven. So I kept going. And by the end of the program, I had seen that it was not about getting rid of symptoms. It was about being okay with anxiety and basically this relationship totally shifting from one of fixing to one of okayness. So that was, but yes, and so I didn't have to, I was already doing nothing, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I just continued to do nothing, basically. <laughs> so I guess maybe it was a little easier for me than for others who are really, you know, in the habit of having seven, 10, 20 strategies to cope on the days that they're anxious. I mean, to this day, I still sometimes use an affirmation or another. I mean, if it makes sense in the moment and if it brings me relief when I feel anxious, I'll do it. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. It comes up in the moment, but I, it's not something that, you know, I see people in the group saying, what do you mean do nothing? What do you mean do nothing? I, I didn't have that struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't have that struggle. Okay, yeah. 
And one of the things I think for our listeners that, and if you're brand new to this understanding, might be a little bit difficult to grasp, is the difference between acceptance, which is kind of a strategy that you you alluded to this earlier, right? The difference between acceptance and what the principles is pointing to is that new thought will come you know in in any given moment new thought is arising and and even to try to accept something in a way is pushing we're pushing against it Mm -hmm. could you expand on that a little bit maybe just with your experience of learning that it's actually pretty recent to me the clarity i don't want to sound too compass or anything, but I mean, it's really seeing clearly the difference between being okay with it and accepting. Like you said, acceptance still means that it's, it's real. It still means it's real in the sense that it means something it as to what I can do or who I am. It means something in terms of my progress or lack thereof. Um, I just think somehow, even a tiny part of me might still think it's real. Whereas this sense of okayness comes from recognizing it's not. And what I mean by being not being real, it means that it's, it's really is like air, like a cloud. It's, a feeling in the moment that's all and it has no meaning as to what i can do what i can who i can be who i am whatever that is it's it's a passing feeling in a moment that's it i don't see the need anymore for accepting that because i i don't accept my feeling of joy when my dog jumps on me, right? I mean, I don't have to accept that. Well, I don't have to accept it when I'm anxious either. It's just passing. It's an experience right now, and then it's gone, replaced by something else. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad we're touching on this because it it's such a subtle point, but it's so important. Yes, I think so too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Because see it, it's, again, another level of relaxation in in our attitude in our in our bodies even it's like oh that's one thing i don't need to do another thing i don't need to do (laughs) and everything that we can take off our list right it helps yep yes yeah so well said um one of the things that we didn't talk about in your bio when i introduced you at the beginning was that you had experienced a traumatic brain injury in 2006 um, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that and about how how your experience of that injury has changed since you came across this understanding. Yes, yes, sure. So, yeah, May 2006, I, um, a TV fell on my head <laughs> in a doctor's waiting room of all places. Mm. And it was not yet the, the time, you know, the age of those thin flat screen TVs. It was a small TV, but it was thick. And it came off his hinges and fell on my head. So I had, uh, after that, I didn't lose consciousness or anything, but I was left with severe vertigo for over five months. Had to do, I think I was almost two years of vestibular rehab. And my anxiety just went through the roof after that. I mean, you know what they talk about hypervigilance? Boy, did I know what it meant. I was always scanning my the rooms to see if anything was dangerous. I remember being in my uh, daughter's school one day and the kids were playing uh, with a big uh, football and it just flew by my ear one day. And I just, I mean, anything was a, an opportunity to, to freak out. Um, over the years, you know, everything I did helped. Again, like with anxiety, everything I did helped. But what I've seen with this understanding is that some things that I blamed on the brain injury had actually nothing to do with it. So there was a huge habit of mind for me around the brain injury. So I, my identity was of an injured brain. 
I could now I see it. I didn't know that before because I was my thinking. So, you know, but now I can see that I constructed this whole image of a wounded person. So, and because of that, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, and, and this and that. And now that I see through thought, a lot of the symptoms that I still attach to the brain injury have gone. I mean, what the, one of the big one is the sensitive to noise. I mean, I was sensitive before, after the injury, it went through the roof. So I couldn't, you know, I had to have earplugs everywhere and big events like I even didn't go to one of my niece's weddings in Belgium one year because I knew it would be a big wedding and I just couldn't be in the noise. And even, you know, it's just not possible. And now I'm just more and more opening up to the fact that even that could have been made up. And I test it as I go along. Like, you know, I went to a Broadway show. It was fine. Huh, interesting. Um, I find myself forgetting my earplugs, something that never happened. And so instead of rushing to a pharmacy, I'm like, we'll see. And I'm okay. So, but being in a big, big room, like at a wedding or at a big venue with a lot of people and music and everything, I still haven't done. So we'll see. Mm. But I'm much more adventurous now because I know it's, it's flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas before it was set in stone, I had been injured and this was how I was. But now I'm so much more aware that you know what it might not be true so why not try it when ready you know if I don't feel ready I won't push myself but I find myself more and more ready to to try it you know is that was is that really linked to the brain injury oh oh no and so far I haven't had a yes so I'm slowly pushing the limits that's all I can do little by little as I get more comfortable I push the limits but so yes I would say the biggest difference is that sense of flexibility of um, pushing boundaries but in an easy gentle way instead of having to try and shift some you know to to move this unmovable boulder now it's just like you know, a, a flexible fence, let's say, and then let's push it a little. So it's a big difference. In, even talking about it, I can feel the difference in in my feeling about it, you know, from rigid to flexible. Oh, I just, I think that point is so important that the way, the way we define ourselves with such rigidity, you know, innocently, and no. and sometimes as a result of these sorts of injuries, or sometimes just based on, you know, how we were raised. Uh, oh, I had an alcoholic parent. And so that means X or Y. Um, and instead, with this understanding, we're able to be much more flexible with what's happening in the moment. Yeah, I love that. Yes, because, you know, and one thing that comes to mind as I listen to you, it was one of my big insights was, of course, we're flexible because the energy that moves through us is infinite. So, of course, there's going to be change is always possible. Mm -hmm. Because thought is by nature renewable, you know, original. I mean, I, I often tell clients, you know, if it wasn't, we would still be painting caves, you know, putting pictures in caves. But we're not, are we? So there's always some kind of thought that hasn't traveled before. So in that, when we see that as true, and it is, I mean, as far as I can tell it is, then rigidity stops making sense. Yep. Yes. So well said. One of my favorite quotes from the Little Peace of Mind 12-week program was um, Shannon Cooper, who I interviewed. She'll be on the podcast in another episode. Um she was talking about thought and how it's energy and the nature of energy is that it wants to move. Yes. And I think that speaks to exactly what you're, you're pointing to. Exactly the same thing. Yes. 
and Shannon is wonderful. She will always you find the right word. But I might still be a little clumsy, but it's exactly the same idea. It's like moving from rigidity to flexibility, and that does that works wonders for us. Wonders. Well, yeah. it did, and I've seen it with so many people that I have to assume it's for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and it as you say, it just does make it makes so much sense. Um, when we just take a step back and look at how humans evolve and how we evolve as people and how and even the the metaphors in nature which where also the intelligence of life is flowing through right nothing ever stays the same from one moment to the next no no one of my uh clients and i still giggle when i say clients because this is so new to me but she said to me, and if who knows, maybe if she listens one day to this, she will recognize herself. But she said to me, it's really about relaxing in the fluidity, isn't it? And yes, and I would take it even further. It's seeing that we are that fluidity. We just are it. Because like you said, we're nature, mm-hmm. like everything else. We, we're, we've thought ourselves out of nature. But sorry, I mean, we are part of nature. So we are that fluidity. And when we start seeing this and experiencing it, then again, this natural flexibility just comes into play and it, it, everything becomes easier. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Well, um, just as we're winding up here, I wanted to touch on the coach training that you're doing with Michael Neal. And you recently were in London, is that right? I was in London in October, in Athens in January. And the day after tomorrow, I'm flying out to Prague for the final week. So yes, it's been quite a journey. It was amazing because I believe it's the only time that he's ever offered a Super Coach Academy in Europe. And I actually love to think that it was because I wanted it, but then somebody else in the group said they wanted it too. So I guess he must have heard several voices saying, please, please. But it was very funny how that came about because I was doing Creating the Impossible, which is a program Michael offers every year. And during that, the first few weeks of that program, you know, I was started playing with the idea of coaching because I could see how much I enjoyed interacting in Nicolas Facebook group and how helpful people seem to think some of my comments were and I had no idea I mean that I could do that I mean it was all new and then so I started playing with this idea but I thought you know being from Belgium I prefer to train in Europe but it has to be Michael because he's my favorite teacher and I'd like to be able to live stream because if I can't travel for some reason, if I'm very anxious and I can't travel, I'd like to be able to still do it on, on live stream. And within two weeks of actually articulating those desires in my, you know, creating the impossible program, he launched Super Coach Academy Europe. It was crazy. And then I remember thinking, oh my God, what's my excuse now? <laughs> no other excuse so I signed up and it's been it's just been incredible to like I said at the beginning of our conversation to experience life reopening in such a way you know there was a a day an evening after um, class I guess that we a group of us walked up a hill in Athens and we had this view over the city with the sea and the mountains. It was just a beautiful sunset. I mean, crazy gorgeous. And I was like, how can this be? How can this be? I mean, a year ago, I was still struggling to imagine that I could ever get out of my limitations. And there I was on a hill in Athens, not feeling dizzy, enjoying the sunset. It, it's unbelievable. And, and all I can say is that that's what this understanding can do. It sets you free. And, and it's, it's helped so many people. I'm nothing special. It's not because I'm special that it's done that. It's because I'm human. And, and, I, and we can all see the same thing. And life can reopen this way. So am I going to be a coach for the rest of my life? I don't know. I don't care. I mean, right now it feels great. 
and it's just part of this reopening of life for me and again possible for everyone everyone mm -hmm. yes oh lovely yeah. yeah so why don't you share Maurice where people can find out more about you and your coaching Oh, sure. So I'm very proud to say that I have a little website, right? So that's very impressive, isn't it? <laughs> so it's uh, flowerpower.com. So it's F-L-O-W-E-R power.com for flow, right? Ah, okay. Flow. And then the email also, don't you know, that's fine too. It's powerflow28 at gmail.com. So, yep, they can find me there. Or of course, and of course, in the uh, little peace of mind uh, community out there, um, I'm still very much a part of that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I will put links to the show notes or in the show notes to this episode uh, to your website. So thank you again so much for being with me here today. Oh, thank you for asking me. It was really, really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to connect with you. Same here. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.